as you're being seated, would you turn in your Bibles, if you have them, or the next page in your worship guides, our orders of worship, to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, looking at verses 1 through 10. When Pam and I were in England, uh, the way we got around primarily was through riding bikes. And we would often have visitors come over with us, and as we would uh, take them around town, the, basically the only way to get around town, or the, the, the best way, uh, was through bikes. So we would get another bike and get someone to come along. And I'm sure you've heard the saying, right? Um, uh, like once you, learn, I don't know if this is saying, it's something like this, but it's basically like, you know, once you learn to ride a bike, you know, you never forget, right? Uh, well, that's not exactly true. Like, when you get back on a bike after 20 years of not being on a bike, uh, it, sometimes it's a little actually more difficult. In fact, we had uh, one friend that came over, and she's like, oh, sure, I know how to ride a bike, you know? I remember my pink one with ribbons. And so she came out, and she was uh, riding the bike with us, and we were going around. And as we started off, like, there were certain things that she didn't remember, like, when you go slower, it's harder to balance. Or, for instance, she didn't, uh, she forgot about how to use handbrakes, and so she'd just start pedaling backwards. And then eventually, after she'd start pedaling backwards and realizing that she wasn't really slowing down fast enough, she would, like, drag her feet like Fred Flintstone. Um, and then one time we were heading off, and we were going through this meadow, and just kind of a ditch to the side. And all of a sudden, uh, we, I looked in front of me, and I didn't see her. She was gone. And she'd fallen into these bushes and gotten caught by thorns. And so we had to kind of sit her down and say, Okay, riding a bike 101, back to first principles. Now, sometimes you have to go back to first principles. In some ways, that's what we're doing here at the beginning of the year. Last week, we talked about the fact that we need God's presence with us. That is a first principle. If God is not with us, what are we doing? And this week, we're going to talk about the gospel, cherishing the gospel. And so Galatians 1, a text all about cherishing the gospel. Galatians 1, verses 1 through 10. Hear God's word. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sin to deliver us from the present evil age. According to the will of God, our, Father, our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For I am now seeking the approval of man or of God. Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Thus ends the reading of God's word, holy, inerrant, infallible, life-giving to us. Let's pray that he would be with us as we study it together. Our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that we would hear the truth this morning and the truth would set us free and we would be free indeed. That's how we want to walk out of here, for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, it was our fourth move in one year, the fourth and final move of our first year of marriage. That's a great way to start off marriage, four moves. And we were packing up to go, and as we were putting all our stuff in boxes, um, uh, and which we knew we wouldn't see for three to four years because we were going overseas, I was looking through some of these boxes, and you know, you learn a lot about yourself when you're packing up, first thing you learn is that you have a lot of stuff that you don't use. The second thing you learn is that you can't quite let go of that stuff, right? You're trying to clear out and you just can't. But we're looking at the, I'm looking at these boxes and I open up this one box and I see a lot of children's books in there. 
And since, um, personally, I didn't read a book until I was 18, I knew they couldn't be mine. <laughs> I'm not being facetious. Uh, I didn't read a book until I was 18. But um, so I was like, well, why is Pam holding on to these children's books? I mean, they must be Pam's, right? Because I don't read. And, uh, and then I opened up the book, and I look on the inside cover, and it says, it has an inscription. It says, to Andrew Flatgard, from your dear aunt. And it was dated 1990, the late 90s, like 97, 99, something like that. And I I thought to myself, Andrew Flatgard, my old roommate, who's 30-something at this time, like around 30, 31, why does he have this, why does he have children's books? And why do we have these? They must have gotten put in in, in the move, right, Uh, before Pam replaced Andrew. By the way, side topic, you can change the smell of a house really quickly by getting a new roommate. Often for the better. In my case, definitely for the better. And uh, so, um, so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, well, we don't need these, right? Uh, Andrew is at this time 30. He's single. He doesn't have kids. What use would he have for children's books? We'll take them and, and leave them at goodwill, right? Done and dusted. He probably couldn't do it because his aunt... Um, you know, dear old aunt, he was worried about her, so I'll do it for him. I was like, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I should probably call Andrew beforehand. He had moved already at this time, so I call Andrew, and I said, Andrew, I've got these children's books, um, and, uh, and I'm wondering, um, I was just going to take them and drop them off at Goodwill. Is that okay? Oh, no. Oh, you want to keep them? Uh, oh, yeah. I'm thinking to myself, what does this 30-year-old single man without kids want? do with his, his children's books that his senile aunt gave him? Like, why did his senile aunt give him the cat in the hat? And he's got to hold on to it. What's going on here? But then it dawned on me. See, what you need to understand is that in the late 90s, Andrew developed uh, a disease, a very debilitating disease, chronic fatigue syndrome. And his was uh, bad, so bad that um, it took him seven years or so to get through undergrad, five years to get through seminary. And there were times when he was so low because of the way that it affected him that he had to stay in a room that was completely dark, and even reading a newspaper headline would exhaust him for a day. And during one of those times, at one of those lowest points, his aunt sent him these children's books. And he would open them up and read them because it was the only thing he could get through. The print was large enough, the text was small enough, And during that time, those were Andrew's kind of saving grace. See, to me, they meant nothing. I was going to leave them at goodwill. But for Andrew, they meant everything. He had recovered this time, but they reminded him of the hope that he had, the love of his aunt. The book of Galatians, and the book of Galatians, the Galatians are in danger of doing a similar thing. They're in danger of undervaluing, not cherishing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're in, val- they're in danger of leaving it. Paul says in verse 6, of quickly deserting it for a different gospel. And so Paul's writing to them to tell them, uh, listen, this message, this good news, this gospel is your saving grace. It is the message of salvation, and you need to cherish it, to cherish it. And in verses 1 through 10, he gives them really three ways to cherish it. And they can cherish uh, in three ways in which we can take on to cherish it as well, this gospel. He says, first, you cherish uh, the gospel by cherishing the servants of the gospel. Secondly, he'll tell them that they can cherish the gospel by cherishing the content of the gospel. And thirdly, they cherish the gospel by cherishing the God of the gospel. So first, the first way to cherish the gospel that Paul points out is by cherishing the servants of the gospel. And there are two things that commend these servants to us and to them. And that is, uh, the first thing is their authority. Uh, You need to understand the context of what's going on here. Um, uh, When Paul's writing the book of Galatians, one of the things that's hotly debated and under question is his authority. And what has happened is... um, 
Paul went and he planted this church in Galatia, and as he was there planting this church, uh, he gets it up and running and going, and then he goes off to plant more churches. While he's planting more churches, some people come from Jerusalem. That would be like the, the mothership church, the, the, the um, first church. And they come in, and as they come there, uh, they start to, uh, to talk to the Galatians. They're like, oh, you heard this from Paul. Well, we don't know too much about this Paul, probably something along these lines. We're not really sure about him, and he doesn't really have the full, the full gospel. And so you need more. You need things like circumcision and other things that we're going to add to the gospel. And so, uh, and so they come in, and they basically say, you know, we need to rewrite your fundamental, uh, your fundamental statement of faith. Um, and Paul hears this because they're like, well, Paul, where does his authority come to, from anyway? And so because he's heard this uh, and because he knows that the gospel is at stake, he writes to them to defend his God-given authority. He actually introduces himself in verse 1, you can see it there, as an apostle. Not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. In other words, Paul is saying that his apostleship, his apostolic authority, his authority is unmediated. He's talking about uh, the time when he was actually um, working for the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And he was uh, hot and heavy on the pursuit of Christians going towards Antioch on the road to Damascus. And as he was going, with a sword in hand most likely, to arrest Christians, God and Jesus Christ arrested him. Called him out of the darkness and into the light. Gave him a call and a commission and a new authority. He no longer was to go on behalf of the Pharisees or the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders at the time. Now he was commissioned by God. And he was to be an apostle. An apostle. An apostle was someone who, uh, it just the basic word means a sent one, but it has a particular um, definition in the New Testament. It's talking about those people who were specifically commissioned by Jesus Christ to interpret his life and work. They were authorized by Jesus Christ to interpret his life and work. And when one was commissioned by one, someone, when they were sent out, they went with the very authority of the one who sent them. That is, Paul's authority was the same as that of Jesus Christ himself. And so he says, listen to me. Listen to my words. Listen, because it is, I have authority as an apostle from God. Now, I can just hear the objection, and I'm sure the objection that you're probably having now, or at least you should have, and the ones that the Galatians would have had, but hold on a second, Paul. Paul unmediated authority? Uh, I mean, who's to say that we should trust in your authority? I mean, come on, what if somebody driving down the 101 today said, hey, Jesus met me in the car. Uh, I said, Jesus, take the wheel, and he did. And when he took the wheel, he commissioned me and gave me his authority, and he says, we need to do this. You'd be like, oh, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, you could imagine their astonishment, right? But just because Paul's authority was unmediated does not mean it's unchecked. Does not mean it's unchecked. Look, he, he actually was recognized by all the brothers who were there with him, verse 2. And if you read on in the book of Galatians to chapter 2, you'll find that even Peter, James, and John, the big kahunas, the cohort of the Jerusalem apostles, they accepted his authority as well. Paul's authority was unmediated, but it was not unchecked. It was one that had checks on it. In fact, in verse 8, he even puts this check on himself. If somebody, even if I come preaching another gospel to you, let me be accursed. So Paul's authority is not unchecked, but it is unmediated. But if that's the case, and what that means is that the words of this book, the words of this book right here, they come with apostolic authority, and that means that they come with the very authority of God. And if that is the case, then that has some implications for us. Here's the first one. I love, I love giving this application to Christians. It's the funnest. Read your Bible. Read the Bible. It comes with the very authority of God. 
read it. But don't just read it. Read it carefully. You know, there's a difference between reading it every day and saying, I'm going to read on the surface until a couple words pop out that give me warm fuzzies. I'm going to take that to motivate me for the day or the week and then go back to another time. No, read it in context carefully over and over and over again, not missing every and, then, or but. Read it. Read it carefully. But also, if this, if this book comes with God's authority, if the words in it are, ver- are very words from God, authorized by God, then this is also what it means. Submit to it. If you read this book and you read it rightly, there will be things in it that you don't understand, one, and two, that you don't like. There are always things in every culture in the Bi- that the Bible stands and it puts a check on. And there are things that we are not going to like when we read this book. And at that point, we have to make a decision. What are we going to do? And some of you are saying, well, wait a second, hold on. Why should I listen to that book? Why should I let it tell me what to do? Why should I let it say what is right or wrong? I mean, in the modern view, basically what has the authority to say what's right and wrong in my life is my personal feelings and my personal experience. But here's the problem. And and then, of course, you can't tell me what to do, and neither can that book. That's ridiculous. I can live however I want, otherwise I'm unfree. But here's the problem with that. If you have no absolute authority, no authority from outside the world and outside yourself coming down, if that is not the case, then basically you have no uh, everything, you've got nothing to base any kind of statement on, even the statement, you can't tell me what to do, or that's not authoritative. It falls on its face. You see, then you can't say to anyone, you can't impose this law on me because I'm free, because what authority gave you that? Well, just yourself? Well, they have another authority themselves that tells, that tells you you need to be locked in a cage or tells them that you need to be locked in a cage. And how can you respond to them? You can't unless there's an outside source of authority, a judge, an arbitrator. You see, this is an authority that we must, we must take on ourselves and we must submit it to. Also, if, if actually God is personal and relational, which we claim he is, then here's the deal. Anytime you have personal relationship, you have to let the other person have a voice. You see, if we just cut out everything in the Bible that we don't like, then basically what are we saying? We've created a God in our own image in a book which we could have written. That's not a relationship. We have to let the other person have a voice. We have to let God have a voice. And if that is the case, then we need to read this book. We need to read it carefully. We need to submit to it. But it's not just apostolic authority. They're giving a special authority, I think. I think this text would also tell us and commend to us not only apostolic authority, but also what I would call ministerial pastoral authority, oh, even though that is, those are different types of authority. The, the fact of the matter is that God has gifted and raised up certain people to preach his word. And those people we need to, we need to submit to their authority and recognize it. Well, why? Well, for two reasons, really. The first is this. If they've been given gifts, and the gifts they've been given are from the Spirit. And that means they come with the Spirit's authority. So accepting those gifts is accepting the Spirit. But the second reason, probably the more important reason, is this. The gospel, by definition, is a proclaimed word. Uh, the word, actually, you and Galilee, the word gospel uh, is a verbal noun. It means the preached gospel, the preached word. And therefore, in order for the gospel to come forth, it has to be preached and proclaimed. And God has gifted and trained, uh, gifted certain people to do that. And we need to cherish them. And here's, here's one of the ways that I think we can. This has not happened for us yet, but I, I want to get us ready for it. We might have a day, Lord willing, we will, where someone will come into this congregation, they'll be raised up in this congregation, and we will see that they have gifts and calling to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they need to be trained. And at that point, we will say, great, go to seminary. And what most churches do at that point is they say, good luck. 
And let me tell you how most seminarians live. They work nights, UPS, to try to pay for their classes. During that time, they do not study at all. Some of them have kids. They go in as best as they can, and then there's pressure on the teachers because the teachers know these guys are gifted and called, and they want to get them through. And so then there is a great inflation where they feel like they need to pass them on seats, even though they haven't studied very well. Of course, how could they? They're trying to put food on the table. And so what we need to do as a church is when God brings these people into our midst, we need to support them. And that's going to take sacrifice, but it is worth it because it is cherishing the ministers of the gospel because it's cherishing the gospel itself. How are they going to hear if someone doesn't preach? And how are they going to preach unless they've been trained? And how are they going to be trained and how are they going to study unless we actually provide the resources? So when that happens, when that day comes, let's be ready and let's do it, okay? So that's the first thing, God-given authority. But it's not only, well, let me just stop actually and say this. Uh, you know, it's the elephant in the room as I'm actually preaching to you. And I guess I just want to say um, thanks. Many of you, many of you are so encouraging to me, particularly when after Uh, during the week or whenever, you come up and you tell me the specific ways in which, and I realize this is awkward, it's awkward, we don't like to talk like this, but you tell me the specific ways in which the preached word, God is using the preached word in your life. And it's such an encouragement to me. It's also an encouragement to me when you look up and nod. You might think that's silly, but especially when you nod, okay, like, okay, you might think most of the things I'm saying are heresy, but like when I read the text, right, then you can nod, at least then. And it's still so encouraging to me. To have people listen and say yes and receive the word. And so many of you have encouraged me throughout the past two years in that. So I just want to say thanks. Keep it up. I appreciate it. It means the world. More than I probably let you know, more than you will know, because it's kind of awkward how do I respond, but thank you. But it's not just, it's not just the God-given authority of these, uh, these servants of the gospel which commend themselves to us, but it's also their God-directed passion. In verse 10, Paul tells us that he is passionate about one thing and one thing only, God. That is what he is passionate about. In fact, in verse 10, he, he talks about seeking approval, and that word for seeking approval in verse 10 is the word pathos. Now, when we think of pathos, we think of... Um, kind of having empathy with someone or feeling sad when they're sad or that kind of thing. But pathos in the ancient world was a a thing that you would hear in uh, high school rhetoric class or your college rhetoric class. Uh, Pathos meant um, actually sharing the values and the motivations and the heart of your audience. And what you would want to do is get on the same page as your audience or win them over by saying that the things they cared about are the things that you care about. The things they value are the things you value. Uh, It's the way a lot of as we're in election time coming up. um, It's the way a lot of politicians talk, right? That's pathos. And Paul says, though, that his pathos, that the page that he's trying to get on, is not with men. That's not the pathos, first and foremost, that he's trying to share. It's God's. Verse 10, for am I now seeking the approval of men or sharing the pathos of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. The passion of Paul, his passion, is to be on the same page, to share the heart and the motivations of God. And he is passionate about a Christ in his kingdom. Elsewhere he writes, the love of Christ controls me. That is the thing that drives me. And consequently, this is one of the ways that you can tell if a person has been called. It's not the only way, but it's one way. Are they passionate about the things that God is passionate about? Are they passionate for Christ and his kingdom? Are they passionate for him? Do they want to be share God's heart? And unfortunately, uh, I think this is one of the most... Convicting, striking, and um, the thing probably that calls me to question my call the most. Not that I 
I think I do share and want to share and have a desire to share the passions of God and his heart and his motivation for the kingdom. But uh, often those things are very much overshadowed by wanting to please people, by success. Uh, Very much overshadowed or drowned out, that passion can be drowned out by being upset that someone might not like me or what I'm doing. And it's difficult and hard and hurts uh, my heart very deeply and sad. But there's someone, uh, a story of someone who isn't like me, a model really, is uh, from when I was um, graduating from seminary at our commencement address. I'll never forget this. Our president, Brian Chapel, and got up to introduce the person who was going to address us. And the sweet and neat thing about this, uh, I love this word, sweet and neat. The sweet and neat thing about this was that when he got up to speak, the person that he called up um, was his former pastor, a pastor that he had had for 15 years, a man by the name of George Robertson. And in his introduction, he said this, you know, I travel a lot as a seminary pr- president, and I also preach at a lot of places, and I'm always gone, but, um, and, but my family stays home. And he says, and here's the thing. Not one week, not one week was I afraid or worried because I knew that they were in the hands of a man who was passionate about God, passionate about the gospel, and passionate about his kingdom. And that is so true. You know, someone who is passionate about the gospel, that is someone you can trust. That is someone who you can put your family and your life in their hands. That is someone to cherish. So first, Paul tells us that we uh, cherish the gospel by cherishing the servants of the gospel. But secondly, he tells us that we cherish the gospel by cherishing the content of the gospel. See, the thing that that they were doing, that these folks who had snuck into the church of Galatia while Paul was gone, uh, verse 7 tells us that they were trying to distort the gospel. Specifically, they were trying to distort the fact that it was a gospel about or of Christ. And only about Christ. See, the gospel is about him. It is about what Christ gave. Verse 4 says, he gave himself. The gospel is not about what we give. It's not about what we do. It's about what he gave. It's about what he did. And this, Paul wants to make specific. that He gave himself. The only thing that we bring to the equation of salvation is our sin. Which is exactly why Paul goes on to say that he gave himself for our sins. And not sin generally, not just sin, but our sins. See, it's one thing to believe that God in Christ died for sins generally. It's another thing to know that he died for my sin. The sins I committed 10 years ago, the sins I committed this morning. We're on him. This is the gospel. The only thing that we bring, the only thing that we bring is our sin. And the only safe place to take our sin is to Calvary. There's no other place to cast that check. You endorse that and you send it straight to Calvary. It's the only place. So where do you take your sin? The AA meeting, the counselor you've been seeing, friends, perhaps to the gym. Where? I'm not saying that confessing your sin or working out your sin in these places isn't right and proper and good in certain way, in certain respects. But at the same time, the fact is, is not unless and until you have taken it to the cross. Because it's the only safe place for it. You see, your sin and my sin, it's like a bomb, a time bomb that is going off. It is activated, it is ticking, and it is going to blow up. And there is no way to deactivate it. And so here's the deal. The only safe place for that, the only safe place is Calvary. Where Jesus can take it on himself and absorb it and leave you safe. Otherwise, it will blow up and your life will be so messy and so broken. So where are you taking your sin? 
Take it to Calvary. The cross of Christ where he died. Your sins that you committed this morning, take it to Calvary. The sins that you committed this hour, take it to Calvary. The sins that you committed last week, take them to Calvary. The little ones and the big ones, all of them. But it also, it's not only about what Jesus gave, this gospel. It's also about what he took. And do you see what he took there? He took us. See, Jesus not only took on our sin, but he took us and he rescued us or delivered us from this present evil age. The gospel is not only about Jesus taking our sin upon himself, it's also about him transferring us into a new realm, a new dominion. Uh, this, uh, this word, deliver, is the word to take something out of one sphere and put it to another sphere. And this is the gospel. The gospel is not just about simply Jesus, uh, your sins being paid on the cross. It is about that. It is absolutely about that. It's central to the gospel. There's another half of that equation, though. Paul starts off the very beginning of the letter saying, he rescued us from the present evil age. And what do we find at the end? For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision count for anything. Not after I've been crucified with Christ and him to me. What counts? New creation. The new creation that I've been put into. This is about world switching. Jesus is taking us out of the power structures of this present evil age. And he's taking us into the power structures of another age. A a world of grace. Of righteousness. So here's the question for me. Question for you. Do you live according to the old world order and their power structures? Are they Lord over you? The power structures of society, uh, the social power structures, the religious power structures, what's acceptable, the expectations of the business world. When, they do, when we do this, it, it is destructive to our lives. Uh, what is it talking about? Let me give you two examples, one from the movies and one from a scenario that you'll know probably pretty well. First is the movies, because later on, Paul talks uh, in this book about these power structures enslaving humanity. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. A great example of this is in the movie The Dead Poet Society. The Dead Poet Society is a movie about a school an institution that has been enslaved by uh, the law. Because the law, though being good, has been taken by sin in the old world order and in the old power structures, and it is misused and abused. And when that happens, it crushes those in its weight. And that comes to a most, the most tense moment or the most tense way in which the, the destructive force of the law comes through is in that character, um, Neil Perry, And his relationship with his father. Because that's often where the law works out. In your relationships and particularly with your relationships with your parents. And and, and the whole time it's saying uh, Neil's father is, is, uh, and he was probably also in the power structures of the law. And it's all about you have to do this. You have to make this. Here are the expectations. And it's not a relationship of love and acceptance. But a relationship of do this or I am not worthy or valuable. And what does it do? Well, I'll give the movie away for you. It kills him. It kills him. That's what the law does under the enslaving powers of sin. It kills. It kills relationships. It kills people. But I'll give you another scenario. The other scenario goes like this. Uh, It looks like a suburban with a lot of nice things in the back, mainly equipment. Soccer cleats, uh, things like uh, goals, uh, hockey sticks, and such. It starts at about 6.30 in the morning driving, taking, um, taking one of the kids to cross-country practice very early. And then uh, it goes back and has to do another thing because uh, the other kid has to be in this certain preschool. Otherwise, they'll, just, they'll be gone, right? We'll lose them. And then we have to go after school, and there are these, and we have to take to these extracurricular activities and these things. And then we finally show up to the, um, we finally show up to the one game, uh, one of the three games that we had that afternoon, amidst the practices and everything else. Totally exhausted, totally worn out, completely, completely uh, feeling just drained. And, uh, and you know the walk. Walking up to the field, 
and knowing that you haven't gotten time, you haven't had time to put on the makeup fully, knowing that the outfit isn't quite right, knowing that other people will stand there in judgment and condemnation, and you know the enslaving effects of the law. Not that wanting, not that wanting extracurricular activities or preschools or all that for your kids is a bad thing. But when you feel this burden, if I don't do this, we're not worthy. If I don't do this, my kids will not live. Then we know the enslaving effects of the law and how they work out even in suburban America. You see, this is what the law does, and it does not bring grace. It does not bring peace. This is what the power structures of the old evil world do. They don't bring grace. They don't be, bring peace. And we can live like they're our Lord. And when we do, we will not feel the grace and peace that Jesus brings. Because what happens when Jesus rescues us from the dominion of darkness, when he pays and purchases our sins, what we find in verse 3 is that the result is this. Paul says it to them, grace and peace to you. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. See, is your life characterized by grace and peace? Where it's not, you're probably living under the enslaving effects of the old world order, which don't cause grace and don't cause peace. Another question, another way to find out diagnostically, if you live according to the Gospels, how do you look at God? Are you on the treadmill? Because three times in verses one through three, God, Paul calls God our Father. Father. That's the relationship that He has towards you, Father. Also, another application point from this do you protect the content of the gospel? In verses 9 and 10, twice Paul says, let me repeat myself. If anyone preaches another gospel, let them be accursed. There are a lot of things that aren't gospel issues and a lot of hills that we don't need to die on, but there are some hills that we do. Are you prepared to? When people start messing with the content of the gospel. So first, uh, we cherish the gospel by cherishing the servants of the gospel. Second, we cherish the gospel by cherishing the content of the gospel. And finally, we cherish the gospel by cherishing the God of the gospel. Um, in certain circles, uh, sometimes I, I've heard this a lot. This word gospel is thrown out there a lot. You probably think I'm overusing it. I, I can understand that. And people are like, why do you say gospel so much? Why don't you just talk about Jesus? And that's a good for- point. It's a fair point. But the interesting thing about this is in verse 6, it says that when you're turning to a different gospel, what you're doing is turning away from him. See, it equates turning to a different gospel, turning away from the gospel, with turning away from him. Why? Because God is the gospel. You see, things like the forgiveness of sins, things like having our our guilt and our shame removed, as glorious as those are, those are simply the the carriers, the means to the end. The great gift of the gospel is that in the gospel, God gives us himself. That's the beauty of it. And if he didn't do that, then all of it's worth nothing. It doesn't matter. It's like in that movie, which was probably the cultural pinnacle of this last um, decade, um, The Princess Diaries. (laughs) In The Princess Diaries, uh, Mia Thermopolis is, uh, finds out that she is actually a, um, she's an heir to the throne, the throne of that great place called um, Genovia, because her grandmother is the queen, Queen Doagner. And as she finds this out and they, she gets into contact with the queen, uh, the queen starts to realize that she doesn't know much about her teenage daughter. And so she decides, well, uh, she says, clear my schedule Let's rearrange all these arrangements because I'm going to spend uh, some time in San Francisco with a San Franciscan, my daughter, or, or my granddaughter. And so she does. Now, could you imagine what would happen if, uh, if uh, uh, Queen Doe Wagner got to, uh, got to San Francisco, and when she got there, her granddaughter wasn't there? 
What do you think she would say? Oh, great, I don't have to work, and I have three days in San Francisco. These are awesome. No. Because that was the whole point of not working. The whole point of going to San Francisco was to be with her granddaughter. The forgiveness of sins, the rescuing us from this present evil age and putting us into a new place. The whole point of those things are so we might get God, have communion and fellowship with him, relate with him. And when we turn from the gospel, we turn from him. We turn from the, his call of grace. Verse 6 says, uh, tells us that we turn from the one who called us in the grace of Christ. Now, when we hear this word uh, call, we think invite, like come here. But, uh, but the word call in Pauline terminology, his vocabulary, it's a very specific word. It's not like invite. It's like God called the world into existence, right? Uh, it's a summons that creates things, brings about the new creation. And, uh, and because of that, we need to understand that when God calls us, this is the call that calls us out of darkness and into light, uh, out of uh, damnation, into salvation. And, uh, and when he does that, he gives us actually our specific calling with that. Paul's call to be a Christian and his call to be an ap- uh, apostle are inseparable. And here's what that means. If you are a Christian here today, you have been called. But that means this, that God didn't just call you to be a Christian. God gave you a calling to work in his new creation. He has a specific place for you in that new creation. And this gives us a new paradigm for even thinking about God. See, it's one thing to think that God is love and that he loves me. It's another thing that, to know he has a pursuing love for me, that he wants me on his team, that he has a specific place for me on his team. And he's come after me to give me that place. And when we reject the gospel, when we turn away, we return away from this role. We turn away from this call. We also turn away from his purpose. Paul says that when he called us, he called us according to the will of our God and Father. And when he delivered us, he delivered us according to the will of God, our God and Father. And while he has specific purpose for us all, he also has one general purpose. I've been thinking about this a good bit since we are about to study Romans on Wednesday night. Come, there's my announcement. And in Romans 121, we find that humanity's great sin was they failed to glorify God and give him thanks. That the reason that they were created, the one great purpose that we have is to glorify God and to give him thanks. And we turn away from that purpose. We turn away from that calling when we leave this. That in, in essence, our lives to be lives of joyful thanksgiving. And Paul even, even shows it. He hints at it in verse 4 what this purpose is and when he starts doing it. To whom be glory forever and ever. This is the end of the salvation. That we might praise God. To whom be glory forever and ever. Yeah, some, uh, in some traditions, the service, and particularly the Lord's table, is called the Eucharist. It means joyful thanksgiving. They call it that because three times, three in the meal, Jesus said, you, he, he prayed thanksgiving. How many times in the meal have you said thanks? Three times he said thanks during the meal, not just before, all throughout. But really, uh, our whole service here is a service of the Eucharist. Service of joyful thanksgiving, on which the table is just a paradigm, a a pinnacle. And really, our whole lives are lives of Eucharist, of joyful thanksgiving, of giving him glory. That's what we're supposed to be doing in everything, of which this service is just a concentrated form. And when we turn away from him, we turn away from that great calling that we have in him. Lives of service, life of joyful thanksgiving. Sammy Gito is from Nairobi. He grew up uh, living in the slums. He cleaned toilets for a living, but uh, that wasn't enough to get food, so he would also go through the trash to try to find food and, and things. One day, when he was rummaging through the trash, he came across a a cardboard wallet, a cardboard-type wallet, and it had a Manchester, University of Manchester um, insignia on it. And because he was a Man U fan, uh, that is, a Manchester United fan, a soccer fan, um, football, as they would say, he kept it. 
And inside this wallet, uh, there was some information, a folded up piece of paper that talked about a program that Manchester United was doing to actually take folks from developing countries, train them, and send them back and pour them back into their um, countries uh, for their good and development and to bring peace there. Well, it was one of the lowest points that he talks about. He was on a drug overdose and in a coma. And God saved him out of it. And when he did, the first thing he thought of was that cardboard wallet. And he went and he got that piece of paper and he found out what he could. And he said, this is it. I'm going to this program. And he enrolled in the program and actually finished and then went back to Nairobi, back to his village to uh, start works of, of uh, rehabilitation rehab- there. You know what? He still has that wallet. And he still has that piece of paper because he saw those as gifts from God. His saving grace and reminder that God had saved him out of the darkness and put him into light and he cherished it. The gospel is our saving grace. It is the message of salvation, the only message of salvation, the only thing that will save us, that will forgive us of our sins, that will rescue us from this dominion of darkness and bring us, bring us into the kingdom of his son. So let's cherish it. Amen.